and 120,000 120, uh, Japanese Americans on the West Coast. Um, uh, the first day of remembrance was held back in Seattle in 1978 as a way to um, arouse the Japanese American community in support of the growing redress movement. And every year since, uh, Japanese Americans across the country have gathered to commemorate and explore the legacy of this historic injustice. Um, and to make sure our histories are never forgotten and to align our str own struggles uh, with those of other marginalized groups um, in the present day. Uh, so this year marks the 80th anniversary of the loyalty questionnaire as well, a racist tool used to demonize and, and divide our community based on perceived Americanness. Um, and even after all these decades, our immigration system and programs like Operation Lone Star, which we're going to learn about tonight, uh, today, uh, continue to use these types of arbitrary policies to criminalize migrants at the southern border. Um, that was my mother probably trying to get on. I'll, I'll help her out later. Uh, New York Day of Remembrance is excited to bring together a program that delves into the uh, traumatic uprooting and resettlement of Japanese Americans to the East Coast and especially to the New York City area after the harrowing years of incarceration. Uh, my own grandmother, Louise uh, Maihara, settled here in, um, settled, well, settled in Manhattan uh, from Maui before moving on to Philly. Um, following her husband's deployment to basic training here on the mainland as part of the 442nd 100th Battalion. While not incarcerated during the war, she often spoke of um, being uh, under surveillance by the FBI officers as she traveled on trains across the United States. And I can only imagine also the crushing weight that my grandfather must have experienced risking his life daily in the most gruesome campaigns of the European theater um, as part of the 442, while his own father, my great grandfather, was imprisoned in a Department of Justice camp in Santa Fe, New Mexico for the duration of the war. I want to turn it over to Becca now. Hi, everyone. My name is Becca Asaki, and I'm also a member of the New York Day of Remembrance. So glad to have you here. Um, so today we'll be hearing a firsthand account of that experience from um, our esteemed New York community member, Suki Tereda Ports, and to honor her incredible legacy. We will discuss how the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II served as a precedent for the detention of immigrants of color to this very day, connecting our legacy of incarceration and displacement to the present day treatment of asylum seekers at the border and here in New York. And most importantly, we will discuss steps that we can take to stand up for the uh, stand up to the continuing assault on human rights and civil liberties by highlighting these connections to end the inhumane treatment of migrants at our borders um, and in New York. Together, we as a community can become the allies that we did not have during the dark days of, the World, War, of World War II and its aftermath. In addition, we'll hold our traditional candle lighting ceremony to honor our community's incarceration experiences and to hold space for those experiencing similar injustices. During this time, we welcome all of you to hold up personal mementos or photos, family names, um, and candles. And you can also type in the names of loved ones into the chat fe feature at that time to be honored. Um, so I'll pass it back to Lucas for a quick land acknowledgement. Thank you so much, Becca. And um, our many thanks to the American, um, the American Indian Community House who have created a land acknowledgement uh, that we've been using for quite some time to use here in New York City. Uh, the land of the five boroughs that make up New York City are tr the traditional homelands of the Lenape, Merrick, Canarsie, Rockway, uh, Matinecock nations. And these lands are also the intertribal trade lands or an, uh, and under the stewardship of many more indigenous, indigenous nations. New York City is home to, to the largest populations of intertribal Native American people, First Nations, indigenous individuals of any urban city across Turtle Island, North America. Um, some were born here with family roots in New York City um, and the area that extend back for generations and others come to New York City to find what they couldn't find um, anywhere else. And each group has contributed to the rich and diverse culture that is New York City urban Indian community. 
Uh, this is their story and their experience. They are a living culture that thrives here. And uh, we acknowledge the systematic erasure of, of, of many nations and recognize those still among us today. And we acknowledge the people of these nations, their cultures, their communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. And we acknowledge the over uh, 115,000 intertribal Native Americans, First Nations and indigenous people who call New York City home right now. Uh, one of the largest in the country. And we acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to Manhattan, the land and waters upon which we stand. And um, now I'd like to introduce Kim, Ima, and Stan, Stan Honda, um, who are now going to introduce the next part of our program. Thank you, Lucas. Um, my name is Kim Ima, and it is my a great pleasure to say a few words about this year's uh, honoree, Suki Tarada Port. When you know Suki, you can't help but be inspired by her determination and conviction, her steadfast belief in the power of speaking up and taking action her belief that we must all look out for each other. Suki's father, Yoshio Albert Tarada, was born and raised in Hawaii. Her mother, Sumiko Takai, was born in Japan and grew up in Seattle. They met in New York City after college, fell in love and got married. And on December 12, 1934, Satsuko Tarada, Suki, was born in Harlem at the only hospital that would allow Japanese women to give birth in New York City, all delivered by the same doctor, Dr. Iwamoto. During World War II, Suki, along with her sister and parents, were under FBI surveillance and her mother was under house arrest for the duration of the war. Suki remembers her mother calling to report whenever they were going anywhere. She has many stories about those years and the impact it had on her family and on those around them during and after the war. After going to Smith College, Suki met her husband, Horace Gonder Ports Jr. They got married and had three children. Horace passed away in 1971 and Suki raised their three kids and has lived within the same six blocks of Morningside Heights her entire life. Suki believes in community-based activism. When Suki saw a cause that needed a voice, Suki spoke up. She spoke up and stood up. And sometimes that meant sitting down, sitting down in front of a bulldozer in protest of the city's plan to take away community park space to build a gym for segregated private use. That protest sparked the 1968 Columbia student protests. And in case you're wondering what happened, that part of Morningside Park remains a public park today. Sometimes that meant creating new organizations like the Minority Task Force on AIDS in 1985, the National Minority AIDS Council, the Family Health Project, and the Asian and Pacific Islander Coalition on HIV AIDS. She has also served on the boards of organizations too many to mention and has been the recipient of numerous awards for her service. And she has always been the queen of the kitchen for our DOR potlucks at the Japanese American United Church. And perhaps I'd add the life of the party. So Suki, today for all that you have done and continue to share with the world, we wanna thank and honor you. As a treasured member of our community, your life's work, your achievements, insights and stories continue to inspire us to invest in our understanding of what it means to speak up and take action on behalf of all of our communities. So now it's my honor to welcome Suki Tarada Port and Stan Honda from Suki's Living Room. Thank you, Kim. I'm Stan Honda and I'm here with Suki Port, Suki Tarada Port in her Morningside apartment. And thanks very much for uh, joining us in the program and letting us honor you, Suki. Even uh, though I didn't clean house. That's all right. They, can't, they <laughs> only can see the beautiful backdrop be, uh, be behind you. And we just wanted to hear a little bit about your life uh, today. 
And I know that you were a child in uh, during the war years, living with your family in New York City. So, how old were you? How old were you? And what was it like being a Japanese American child during the wartime? Well, I was born in 1934, so it was a few years before the war began. But my mother, who was born in Japan, was not allowed to leave Manhattan. And every time she called, I always thought she was calling our father, but it was not. It was the FBI when she was calling to say she wanted to leave the house. And my sister and I used to always wonder how come she knew that our daddy knew that she was taking us to school every morning, but we assumed she was calling him. It was not. She was always calling the FBI to let them know and to get permission to leave our apartment. Yeah, that must have been after you found what after you found that out, found those the actual uh, circumstances. It must have been very strange looking back on that. Well, it was. Um, partly because it only came up when I was taking our children to, um, you know, some place. And, and um, I, that's when I found out that, that the reason we were not calling our father, the reason we were calling was my mother was calling the FBI. And it was very strange to find that it was because she was not allowed to leave the apartment under the FBI's rules that because my mother was born in Japan, she was not allowed to leave our our Manhattan home. Right, right. And so as a Japanese-American family in New York City, you had a much different experience than many of the Japanese-Americans around the country. Uh, I know that you're, uh, you had a very poignant experience, which you found more information about later on, about your parents not visiting you uh, at your summer camp, you and your sister. Well, my sister and I were sent to summer camp as as most American children went to a, a camp during the summer to leave Manhattan or any city home to go to the country and be able to swim and play, you know, sports. And, and so my sister and I were very sad. We went to the woods and we cried that mommy and daddy didn't love us the way other American families loved their children and came to visit at camp. And we always thought it was just very sad that our parents didn't come to visit us. And it was not until I was taking my children to summer camp and we said to my mother, uh, I, you know, I, I don't, after all those years from the time that we were growing up until the time that we had children and, and I was taking our children to camp that I said to my mother, we're going to go visit our children at camp because we think it's important for parents to visit their children at camp just like all the other parents do. And at that point, my mother burst into tears and said, we would have come to visit you, but the FBI wouldn't let me leave Manhattan. And it was not until then that I found out why our parents didn't visit us at camp. Wow, so she, she held it in all those years. All those years, and she didn't feel it was, you know, appropriate for, for us to know that, that she was under house arrest from the FBI. Right, right. And then she was under house arrest because she was a Japanese national. Right? Yeah. Okay. So she was treated differently than the Japanese Absolutely. American. It was not until several years after World War II ended that my mother was finally allowed to become, a, you know, a citizen. Right. Right, yeah, due to the laws back then. Uh, I know that you've been really active in the community, in a lot of different communities. Uh, how did you uh, get involved? What what draws you to, to action as a community activist? Well, partly because I grew up in Manhattan and I went to school in Manhattan and I went to school with other children whose parents did things. And so I, I you know, did whatever the other kids did. And, and um, that's how I learned how to become active in, in the community. Uh-huh, yeah. So then what, uh, what are some of the bigger projects that you've been involved with over the years? Well, one of the things that I felt was important was that we went to um, summer camp and our parents didn't visit us. And that was, we found out later because the FBI wouldn't let my mother leave Manhattan and my father didn't think it was nice to leave our mother alone in Manhattan and, and he would come to visit. So neither visited and my sister and I thought that was sad that our parents didn't come to visit us. But right. 
one of the other issues was that um, we saw that there were lots of children whose parents were not in integrated communities. Mm -hmm. the, the black families lived in Harlem and the white families lived in Manhattan and Westchester and other places and our parents just really didn't belong to any other. They were among the few um, Japanese ancestry parents. Most of the other families lived on the West Coast and were sent to summer camp, to, to concentration camps during the war. And they moved back to California. Very few came to live in Manhattan. And, and of the people of Japanese ancestry who lived in Manhattan, many were connected with Japanese corporate um, organizations that came from either Europe or came from Japan to directly to New York to the Japanese corporations that a, a lot of them were, were, you know, set up here in, in New York. Right, right. What drew you to uh, be involved with AIDS activism? Well, one of the things that I saw was that white Originally, it was thought that only white gay men got AIDS, and then it became obvious that women could get AIDS if they mm -hmm. were in sexual relationships with people who had AIDS or who were possibly able to get AIDS if they had sexual relationships with men who, who were possibly exposed to it. And, and it was one of the issues that that I saw that Asian families were not included in AIDS education. And it was important that if Japanese men and women were to be saved from getting a disease that could conceivably kill them, um, they needed to get the education. And it was not until they became eligible to get education, and, and one of the things was that, that I, having been educated in New York and then went to college in Massachusetts, all, all women's school, and learned about things like AIDS, that it was not until at that point that it was necessary to teach people in the Japanese community about the, the, the exposure to AIDS being possibly fatal. Uh so any advice for all of us as to how to get involved with community act action? Well, I think it's important to become involved in, you know, one of the things that happened in Japanese communities that because of the concentration camps and because of the things that happened during the war, Japanese families didn't become involved in issues. They became very quiet and didn't speak up about issues. And so it was very important that we, learn about the lack of education for people of Japanese families who raised children who went to public schools but whose children didn't know that their parents were not in the education cycle. Mm -hmm. And so it was critical that we teach our children to become involved and, and to learn about the exposure to getting information so that their children could learn about things that, that other people were learning about because their families learned about it. Right, right. That, that's great. I know that you've received a lot of awards and accolades over the years. We'd like to present you with a very modest uh, certificate. Oh, wow. Thank you, thanking you very much for oh, your service exciting. to the Day of Remembrance program. Thank you so much. And all the various uh, community activism well, that is, you've done. This is very special. Sure. We're, we're very, is, thank you. We're very this glad is, to is, have you on the program. This, this, this is very special because, you know, people in the, in the Japanese community don't speak up very much. Uh, uh, that's not a problem with you. I've never found you never to speak up about anything. Well, part of, <laughs> part of it was because I went to an all-women's college, okay. and I learned that women needed to learn about various issues and to speak up because women were not I, – I was the only in my class of 640 women. Mm -hmm. I was the only non – well, I was the only person born in the U.S. 
in New York City, the only person who didn't know that her parents or any other people in the community were not part of the education cycle. Right, right. And so it was very important to 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 learn to speak up or otherwise our children would not know that they needed to speak up or somebody with a face like mine. Mm -hmm. It was assumed that I was Chinese. Right. And then when it was found I was not Chinese, they assumed that I was born in Japan. Right. And I was of Japanese ancestry because I was born in Japan. Mm -hmm. So it was not for many years that people learned that my mother was not allowed to leave Manhattan during World War II yeah. and that I grew up I've grown up in the same six blocks. I know, yeah. From yeah. the time that I was born, and my mother was born, uh, I was born in the Harlem Hospital because my mother was not allowed to deliver a baby in the white hospitals in, in Manhattan. Well, really, we're glad that you speak up, Suki, because well, we're, we're we're much better for the for that fact that you. Thank do you. That. This this is this is this really means a lot to me because it's it's. Well, it's it's very special that that. Um, well, we're glad you could join us today, and I'm well, I very glad I, to. I thank you. Okay. This is, this is very special. Great, great. Well, well, thanks for your uh, for your insight and and your uh, your advice and everything. So now uh, the next part of our program, uh, Lucas Rotman, uh, Becca Saki, and Mike Ishi will lead that part of the program. And thanks very much, Suki, again. Well, thank you. This is this is very special. Oh my goodness! Thank you so much, Suki, again uh, for sharing so much about your life. Uh, I, I could listen to you for hours, uh, so I really appreciate um, you sharing. And thank you, Stan and Kim, for helping to honor this really incredible leader that we have in Suki. I'm so glad that we could have this as a part of our program today. Um, so uh, today that you know we're gathering to remember and honor stories uh, like Suki's stories, um, unfortunately, of, of repression and of removal that many of us um, and our families experience. And to be honest, it's, it is quite chilling to reflect on the similarities of what we're seeing, uh, what we heard even in Suki's story and things that we're seeing in New York City today. So our community has a history of experiencing human rights violations that we hear echoed in, in stories of migrants today. Things like indefinite detention, poor food and sanitation, a lack of privacy and of substandard healthcare, um, just really to name a few. And uh, however, the, the legal and policy failures, the intergenerational trauma and economic engines are, are similarly striking, right? So military necessity and threats of national security um, that we're used to target our communities have been replaced by securing the southern border and so-called emergency response to a surge of migrants. In both instances, these policies are driven by a race, racist agendas um, and rhetoric and have a deep and long-lasting impacts on communities of color. So as our community over 80 years ago, migrants today are being stripped of their legal rights and are at the whim of those interpreting policies that fail to really center the humanity of those who are targeted by them. And we're seeing a new generation of families being traumatized and we know that this trauma will last generations as it has in our community. The, the economic engines that drive uh, that drove our communities off of their land and out of our communities are echoed in the profit drivers that have created and are sustaining the largest prison system and immigration prison system in the world. So we see so much repetition of history across the country in the targeting of immigrant communities of color with forced removal and detention, but we really don't need to look any further than right here in our beloved city. Uh, over the past eight months, we've seen thousands of migrants bust across the country to New York only to be detained in tent cities described as intake sites. These sites are many, in many ways, are based off of the emergency intake sites that uh, are currently being used to detain migrant children. And many Japanese Americans were similarly displaced to the East Coast from concentration camps and faced similar harsh treatment and failures to support, uh, to, to provide sufficient support for resettlement. Um, 
So to, to share a little bit more about our com own community's history of resettlement in New York, uh, I actually want to hand it off to Lauren Sunita, who, who will give us a little bit of that background information. Lauren? Thank you so much, Becca, for um, uh, for outlining our painful past and present connections of our communities. And hello to everyone. Um, I'm a fellow New York Gay Remembrance Committee member. And um, as Becca mentioned, um, many Japanese Americans in camp were uh, dispersed to the Midwest and East Coast for work and housing uh, starting in 1943. The War Relocation Authority initiated resettling incarcerated Japanese Americans um, if the WRA deems them loyal enough. Uh, Lucas mentioned the loyalty questionnaire earlier. Um, in my own family, not everyone was able to leave camp at first, but my grandparents went from Detroit to Ohio to Chicago and eventually ended up in Washington, D.C. for several years. Uh, and I learned that my great grandfather, an Issei who was incarcerated at um, Fort Missoula and then Rower, uh, came to New York City, actually, in 1945. So in an attempt to figure out how he got there, I started learning more about New York's resettlement history, um, also through the New York uh, Japanese American Oral History Project. Um, so today, I wanted to invite folks, too, to share in the chat uh, where your own knowledge and experience um, or your family's experiences might fit into or expand upon the very brief overview history that I share uh, as I go. So um, to start, uh, you can see in 1943, um, Japanese Americans from camp started arriving in New York City, about 1,000. And then over about 70% of those who were resettling in New York were Nisei. And uh, by 1946, 1947, the New York City Japanese population grew to several thousand. Uh, so you, I've put in a few um, newspaper articles as we go from UC Berkeley's archives. Um, so you can get a sense of like the coverage too of what um, New York resettlement looked like. Um, New York had um, longstanding pre-war Japanese American community and churches and restaurants and grocery stores that helped ease the adjustment process a bit for newcomers coming out of camp, as well as interfaith religious coalitions and nonprofits that really did collaborate to find housing solutions for Japanese Americans who are trying to find their feet in New York City. Um, so, for example, uh, the community church in New York Unitarian Service Committee opened the Manhattan Hostel, and then the Brooklyn Hostel at 168 Clinton Street opened in 1944 and housed uh, 1,600 Japanese Americans over its two years of operation, including my great grandfather. Um, however, even with um, the support and resettlement, um, there were, um, oh, and sorry, here you can see uh, on this slide. Um, a bit more of the coverage of the Manhattan and Brooklyn Hostel, and I threw in um, some mail that I found addressed to my great grandfather here. Um, there was, however, um, also pushback, and uh, in the resettlement of Japanese Americans to New York, um, there was considerable discrimination and resistance. Um, the WRA New York field office tracked widespread job discrimination and white New Yorkers protested that New York was accepting Japanese Americans, uh, specifically targeting the Brooklyn Hostel being opened. Um, Mayor LaGuardia, uh, who also protested the Brooklyn Hostel, cast Japanese Americans as a military threat and stated that New York should not have to accept them. So um, uh, in the newspaper article here, you can see um, some of his protest points um, to the right. Um, uh, luckily, um, or, or very uh, inspiringly, um, the NAACP and the ACLU and other faith groups came together to condemn LaGuardia's racism and call for Japanese American safe placement in the community. And I was really struck by this as an example of cross-community coordinated advocacy for newcomers, um, and that many of the organizations that helped Japanese Americans find their feet, like Catholic Charities, American Friends Service Committee, Community Service Society, all coming from the WRA archives and files. Um, they continue to do this work today with the immigrants that are coming to New York. Um, so um, due to both incarceration and resettlement, um, Japanese Americans ended up in so many unfamiliar places. Uh, we were uprooted, scattered, and disconnected. 
um, whether uh, our families were restarting in New York or surrounding farm communities like Seabrook, New Jersey, or also similarly for those of us who were already here and impacted with house arrest or surveillance like Suki's family, or having Mayor LaGuardia shut down your business and arrest you after Pearl Harbor um, or being detained at Ellis Island. These are also parts of our history um, in New York and Japanese Americans um, have this really layered history of resisting white supremacy in their efforts to build community here in New York. Um, the New York resettlement history also speaks to how after the trauma of being uprooted and the loss of our original neighborhoods and social ties, even when we're faced with that discrimination and denial of resources that are all fueled by racism, uh, people can mobilize together to support the displaced to find more safety here. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to Mike now to talk more about the forces that are directing the mass displacement we're seeing. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lauren. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Ishii. I'm also a member of the New York Day of Remembrance Committee and also a co-founder of Sudu for Solidarity. And I'm a descendant of people who were incarcerated at the Minidoka uh, concentration camp. Um, what I'm about to share um, today may be actually very difficult to hear because it's actually what's taking place in our country right now. Since the summer of 2022, New York City has been receiving sometimes many thousands of migrants on buses from Texas every week. And here's why. Operation Lone Star, or OLS for short, is an over $4 billion funded enforcement operation that targets migrants for arrest, jail, and deportation in Texas. It was created by Governor Greg Abbott to support his political aspirations. This illegal and discriminatory scheme is designed to criminalize and rapidly deport migrants who are seeking safety in the US and who are exercising their legal and constitutional right to seek asylum. OLS is a dangerous precedent that it violates the constitution, promotes racial profiling, fuels the mass incarceration of people of color and encourages white supremacy rhetoric that is harmful not only to Texans, but actually to the entire country. Since the summer of 2021, Governor Abbott has worked closely with officials of Kinney County in Southern Texas to create OLS. Based upon a blueprint left over from the Trump administration, the governor has used a racist narrative of border security and invasion to justify the creation of a massive militarization force and criminalization of people exercising their human rights. By over... <laughs> I'm going to ask you to mute yourself, please. By overstepping federal authority on immigration, Abbott has redirected and weaponized state resources and personnel to target immigrants in Texas. And he is working with other conservative governors who have sent state troopers to Texas to support and learn how to export OLS to their states. This will be the blueprint going forward as part of the war on migrant communities of color. Unfortunately, instead of resisting this racist war on immigrants of color, the US government is cooperating with Governor Abbott. Border Patrol and ICE work regularly and closely with Operation Lone Star. In October of 2022, I was part of a human rights delegation organized by grassroots leadership, an abolitionist community-based organization in Texas. And for a week, I witnessed firsthand OLS. I was deeply traumatized by what I saw there. I saw a militarized war upon black and brown bodies using the carceral and military apparatus of the state. I can report to you directly that the communities of the southern border are currently living in a war zone complete with massive troop deployment of over 10,000 armed enforcement officers, military armed vehicles, checkpoints on highways, and widespread surveillance. 
This has had a tremendous detrimental impact upon border communities who are now living in a militarized zone. OLS has drained funds away from essential necessities in a state lacking a functional electrical grid, lacking hospitals in rural areas, struggling with issues of food and housing security and gross education system deficiencies. Corrupted county officials like those in Kinney County use OLS to raise exorbitant bond funds on migrants who have been wrongfully charged with misdemeanor crimes by corrupted judges, forced to sign away their legal representation in detention and then run through corrupt mag magistration hearings and then deported. In some cases, these magistration hearings take place in county parking lots where dozens of migrants are lined up, stripped of their right to legal representation, and then run through a kangaroo court proceeding. And who is being enriched by billions of dollars being spent on OLS? It was surely not the working class communities that I drove through who lacked paved roads. The governor has requested an additional $4.6 billion of taxpayer money for OLS in 2023. And part of the original nearly $5 billion spent on OLS already was diverted from federal COVID relief funding. So how do the buses to New York City correct or connect to Operation Lone Star? Well, as part of the rhetorical war, migrants bus from Texas are being put on buses with much media fanfare and shipped to New York City and other cities. Additionally, Democratic mayors are also now busing refugees to NYC. The diversion of funding from border communities who could offer mutual aid and the lack of support for alternatives to detention and abortion by the current administration are also feeding into this horrible situation. In some cases, this busing creates new forms of family separation. OLS is just the next example of using people who have fled extreme forms of violence, who are being denied both their international and constitutional rights to seek asylum and are being used in political gamesmanship. Now, let me hand this over to Lucas who can talk to you about actually what is happening here in New York City. Thank you. Hello, Mike. Um, thank you so much. That was uh, really a great background and context for understanding the un Operation Lone Star and its its impact on targeted communities and and on our on our democratic values. Um, I've had the opportunity uh, to spend time volunteering with new arrivals at Port Authority bus terminal in Midtown Manhattan, where um, uh, these folks are being are 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 are, are being busted in, um, and I'm working. I've been working with a group that's been very consistently um, on the ground from the very beginning. They're called Team TLC NYC, and we're going to drop their information in the chat because um, I highly recommend um, anybody who can to support this group because they are they're really doing the work on the ground of, of supporting and helping our new arrivals, our new New Yorkers. Um, and there's been up to uh, 40,000 new arrivals who've passed through the terminal doors since the beginning um, when Mike was talking about the influx began around the summertime. Um, and maybe we can go to slide 15. Um, it's a, the journey that the first thing you need to know is, is the journey that these folks have undergone is one of the most perilous and dangerous um, in the world to get here. All right, they, they cross over, um, the, most cross over the Darien Gap by foot. And um, this is including families with babies and young children. Um, this is a deadly stretch of dense jungle, one of the most deadly in the world uh, between Colombia and Panama. It's filled with uh, narco traffickers and kidnappers. Um, and it has rivers and mountains. Um, it is, a, uh, you know, it is an extremely dangerous place. And then after that, they then trekked through, um, they then trekked through six to eight different countries um, to get to our southern border. 
um, in any means that they're they're able to take. Some some have come by foot, um, and they turn themselves over to immigration authorities to ask for asylum because they are asylum seekers and they have the right to do that. Um, I've had personal experiences that I'd like to share. Um, I remember speaking uh, at Port Authority, I was speaking to a four-year-old child who described how her father, um, crossing the river, uh, put her on top of a shoulder and together they crossed a torrential river in the rain. And she, she described to me um, how, how she watched scores a, a bunch of bodies, dead bodies, floating by her in this kind of a torrential river um, as she was going by and, and the chill of the water as it soaked her bones. Um, I was doing some volunteer work at PS 51 where many children of, of, of migrant families go to schools and I was doing writing with a five-year-old girl who drew a picture of her family with the mom and sister up in the clouds. When I asked her about, you know, why they were up there, she said, oh, yeah, they live in the sky with God now. And it turns out um, that uh, they, they died during the journey. Um, you know, two very young children. Um, I, I should also note that um, as bad as it is for for so many, um, it's even worse for the Haitian and African refugees, what they have to face, because they have a longer journey and the anti-black racism that they face and language barriers are, are, are almost insurmountable. So it takes them often much longer and they are often are even more traumatized. And we can go to, oh, thank you. Um, one of the experiences most talked about by, by the new arrivals um, is they always talk about freezing conditions at the detention centers um, that Mike was talking about at the border. Um, they call them uh, hileras or ice boxes. And in the beginning of my time um, uh, volunteering at the Port Authority, we, we had to have an emergency medical unit set up for folks getting off the buses because so many people were coming off sick and, and many times, mostly with respiratory infections like pneumonia. Uh, with COVID, with severe flu symptoms, um, uh, with their with their asthma, sort of having asthma attacks. Um, while I was there, one child um, uh, stopped breathing, and they had to rush this 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 poor kid off to the hospital on a gurney. Um, and I never found out uh, what what ended up happening to him. Uh, one of the most important jobs of the Spanish speaking volunteers uh, is the first thing they have to do is board the buses. All right. Board the buses as they come in from Texas because they don't, you know, and they don't tell anybody when the buses are coming in or anything. Um, and so you get on the, the somebody gets on the bus and um, they have to you have to tell folks on the bus that they're in New York City now. Yes, because um, they don't tell anybody as they load these folks onto the buses where they're going. Um, and one of the things that I found personally the most difficult to hear and most heartbreaking was the, to witness the tears uh, of men, women, and children who were separated from their loved ones and family members, either in the detention process or after being loaded onto the buses. Um, and as, as you see folks coming in from at Port Authority off the buses, one thing, first thing you notice is sort of like, where are their shoes? They are wearing flip-flops and Crocs uh, often, most of the time, actually. And when you ask them, so what happened to the original clothing uh, and footwear, they state that all their belongings, all their belongings, except for some, maybe some paperwork, were, were, were taken from them and thrown in the garbage by um, immigration officers. So by the time they get to Port Authority, they've spent months, and in the case of some Haitian and African migrants, often years, making this journey, being detained and imprisoned in both Mexico and on the U.S. border, they're forced onto a bus for two or three days from the Texas border, a uh, few opportunities to stop for food, and they arrive confused, hungry, dehydrated, in need of clothing, um, water, medical attention. But I've always been amazed that, you know, despite um, 
despite all that they've been through, how they're able to smile and their faces light up as they step off the buses, um, you know, with hopes of a new life in, in, in New York City. Um, while many migrants uh, pass through New York City on the way to other places, and one of the things that Team TLC, NYC, and other groups do is to sort of help um, help people get to other places if they have family there. Um, it's estimated that about uh, 28,000 new migrants have decided to stay. And uh, many of these folks don't have the traditional connections that other um, immigrant groups may have um, in, here in the city, and they require more assistance. Uh, especially true of uh, the Venezuelans have been um, up to up to a little while ago, they were sort of like the majority of folks coming over. Unfortunately, the city, state and federal governments have failed to provide any kind of services, any kind of appropriate services and resources uh, for these folks, leaving it up to mutual aid groups to fill the void. And um, in the chat, we're going to drop in three of three of the uh, organizations that I've uh, worked with uh, Team TLC, um, artists, athletes, and activists, and the um, South Bronx Mutual Aid, um, um, who are also, South Bronx Mutual Aid is doing a lot of activist work as well, um, and need to be credit for that. Um, while the city is legally obligated to provide housing to all who seek it, our shelter system has been severely overwhelmed already with, with our domestic population. And the city's answer to this understandably challenging problem has been the building of these large migrant relief centers. Yeah, look kind of familiar, uh-huh, right. Um, which are either tent-like structures or warehouses um, uh, located in isolated and flood-prone areas. You know, the um, one of the first ones, the Orchard Beach facility, actually had to be, was in the news because it was closed after it was um, flooded by a fall storm. And um, while far from perfect, yeah, you can see that in the slide, while far from perfect, um, the city had begun because of the pr pressure put on by immigration advocates to sort of like take a more effective approach. And they started housing folks in these underused uh, hotels, which are, you know, uh, filling or, you know, which we have a lot of in New York City um, since the pandemic. Um, and though this is a temporary fix, but it's definitely a more humane arrangement rather than the rows and rows of cots lining the freezing prison life relief centers um, that you can see in uh, slide 19. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the city doesn't seem to learn from its mistakes since begun removing the male asylum seekers from the Watson Hotel in Midtown Manhattan where folks had already established themselves and had jobs and things like that and forced them off to a drafty warehouse space at Red Hook uh, Ferry Terminal uh, in Brooklyn. Um, the, the residents of Watson were not pleased at all with this um, and they actually staged an encampment um, outside the hotel after refusing to accept uh, the dismal conditions uh, that they had to go through there. Um, one one gentleman who was at the uh, protest told me, he says, yeah, uh, I'm not going back there. It's like a prison, okay? I am not going back there. Um, and he joined the encampment. So unfortunately, the police finally broke up the encampment um, and forced them all out to the Red Hook site. Uh, now, for those of us, you know, for folks of Japanese American ancestry, uh, these structures can't help but obviously to elicit a visceral response from us as we reflect on our own um, family history of forced removal and relocation. And just wanted to say that our newest arrivals, they don't want, they want nothing more. The first thing they ask when they get off is, Ken, do you have a job for me? <laughs> we wanna work. Um, our newest arrivals want nothing more than to make a better life for themselves and families. And they have so much energy and drive and creativity to offer our city and our country and 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 i know i know we can we can all do we can do, surely do better than this um i'd like to turn this over to becca who will discuss some of the actions that we can take to educate ourselves and to support and stand up for migrants and asylum seekers Thank you so much, Lucas. And thank you to Mike and Lucas for really laying out um, a lot about the policies that are targeting 
migrants in Texas and also their experiences once they arrive in New York. Um, and, and for highlighting also how these experiences are not so different from our own communities. Um, and um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what can we do, right? Um, now that we've, we've learned quite a bit um, about, about what's going on uh, at the Southern border and here in New York. So um, first, I just wanted to say that uh, Student for Solidarity is actively organizing to end policies like Operation Lone Star, to end child and family detention, um, including through direct actions at detention sites. Uh, and so the working group that is really thinking in particular about ending child and family detention meets on Tuesday evenings um, at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, I will say they are quite fun, uh, even though it is, is so late. Um, and you can reach out to me directly. Um, I think that my email will be dropped in the chat, um, but I am helping to organize um, that work um, as a part of Student for Solidarity. So, um, and and we at Studio, we, we also know that it can feel like, oh, maybe we don't know enough about uh, immigration or maybe we don't know enough about Operation Lone Star. Oh my gosh, I just learned about it today. Um, I maybe I'm not the person um, that, that could be involved, but that isn't true. Um, our community experiences and our passion uh, about supporting other communities is really enough. Um, and each one of us started not knowing that much about any of these things, um, but we really help each other to learn more. And so we've also been hosting webinars to share more information about immigration detention um, for our communities, specifically for the Japanese Americans, so that we can learn more about these policies. We can hear from partners on the ground um, to better understand the experiences of those facing detention um, today. And so um, if you reach out to me um, or sign up um, for the newsletter from Tutor for Solidarity, uh, information about those webinars will also go out. Um, and um, here in New York, the Day of Remembrance Committee is also planning on hosting a direct action or gathering of some kind uh, this spring. Um, to be in community with those who have uh, recently arrived on the buses and to fight for better conditions and support. So um, as Lucas mentioned, there's lots of mutual aid organizations that are supporting folks, um, but we also want to be able to connect with a specific history that we have um, around resettlement um, and removal and detention um, to connect with those who are, are directly impacted right now. So you can reach out to um, us at the, the email that will drop in the chat, but Dave Remembrance NYC at gmail.com. Um, if you're interested in helping us plan the action or join the action or, or think about um, how we might um, be together more in solidarity with folks um, in New York. So, um, you know, I think just to kind of close, like we really do have a unique perspective um, to bring as a community that has experienced removal, repression and resettlement and our solidarity is really needed in this moment. And so we hope that you're able to join us in, in that solidarity right now. Um, so um, to now honor that history that really grounds and our activism, um, I'm, I'm very happy to hand things over to Allison and Suya for the candle lighting ceremony. Hi, I'm Allison Hirodo, um, and we will soon begin our annual candle lighting ceremony. Uh, this part of the program is a space for everyone who would like, that we would like to hold in our hearts today and remember. Um, I think of and admire our community's long legacy of embracing both social justice and grief, and the path to healing that our community members have made through all of these chapters of our experiences. Holding Day of Remembrance gatherings, remembering and honoring our loved ones, what they lost and what we have lost, is part of how we make space for our grief, our love, and our care for one another. And as Becca mentioned at the top of the program, um, please have any photo or memento you'd like to share close by so you can hold it up as we read the names of the 10 camps and take a moment to reflect and honor friends and family. Um, we will take about a minute per camp during which time you can unmute yourself. It's a 
little my, uh, microphone icon at the bottom left of your screen, perhaps on the top if you're on an iPad, um, or you can type something in the chat feature. Hopefully most of you have found that by now, but again, it's probably at the bottom of your screen or maybe under a little section entitled more. Um, and then just a friendly reminder to please remute yourself once you have spoken so we don't get any uh, feedback or too much background noise. Uh, we'll use a bell that will signal that we are moving on to the next camp name. Thank you, Allison. Good afternoon, I'm Sia Yi. Uh, the photos that you're about to see span decades of our programs and highlight key moments when we uplifted our community through remembrance and made our experience visible with our campsites. Poston, Arizona. The Kodama family and Honda family, my mother and father's family. The Hiroto family, my grandparents, um, Yujiro and Shizuka Hiroto. The Weta family, Alice Weta and her parents and sisters and brother. Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Remembering James Takumi Morioka and June Utako Motoike, who were incarcerees at Heart Mountain. Also, my grandparents who made the big trek from Hiroshima and Totori to California and Hawaii. I'm honoring my grandmother, Wakako Nishimoto, who is at Heart Mountain, along with my great grandparents. I want to honor my grandmother, uh, Nobu Sekaguchi Asaki, who was there with her mother and sisters um, after leaving Tuli Lake. I want to honor my parents, Henry and Virginia Watanabe, who were imprisoned with me at Heart Mountain from September 42 to February 43. And my grandmother, Natsue Zaima, who was also there with her children. Topaz, Utah. I like to honor the Takahashi family led by Tsuya Takahashi. Uh, she had 12 kids. Most of them were at Topaz and also the Shimada family, including my mother, Miyuki Takahashi. Jerome, Arkansas. I'm honoring my grandfather's family, uh, the Nishimotos and the Kaminishis who are at Jerome. Um, I'm honoring my grandfather, Goro Asaki, and his uh, parents and siblings who were at Jerome, uh, along with their friend, Alice Takamoto.
I'm honoring my grandparents, May Asaki Ishimoto and Paul Ishimoto and their family. Manzanar, California. I would like to honor the Hori family in Manzanar, California, from Los Angeles, California. Rower, Arkansas. My great aunt. What's her name? My great aunt. Um, Tiona Kamaran, her husband, from Hollywood, California. I would like to honor my grandfather's family, also um, based in LA, incarcerated at Rower. Tule Lake, California. I'd like to honor my parents, Midori and George Morita, and also my brother Harvey. And we, they were in Los Angeles, California. Minidoka, Idaho. I'd like to honor my mother, Sherry Uehara of Seattle, and her parents, Mary and Nobi Nakagawa, and their respective families, the Sasakis and the Nakagawas. I'd like to honor my grandmother, Lillian Inana and her sister, Betty Hasegawa, from Seattle, Washington. I'd like to honor my father, Kenji Ima, and my grandparents, aunt and uncle. Um, and I just wanna say the image in the back is of my father yesterday at the Wing Look Museum. And on display, they have his teddy bear and drawings from his time at Minidoka as a child. I'd like to honor the Nishitani family and the Sakamoto family, in particular, my mother, Marie Sakamoto Ishii, who were incarcerated at Minitoka. I'd like to honor my cousin. Go ahead. My cousin, Kenji Ima and the Ima family who were incarcerated at Minitoka.
Gila River, Arizona. I'd like to honor my um, maternal grandparents, uh, the Akiyama and Satsumi family, and especially my uncle Sam back there who is um, serving our country while his family was incarcerated. I would like to honor my father, Satoru Tsufura, who's in the photo holding Hila, and his brother, Tadashi, to the left of him, Tsufura, and their brother, Hitoshi, and their father, Shosetsu, and their mother, Midori. And all those, especially who loved baseball and played it in Gila River. Granada or Amachi, Colorado. I'm uh, I'm a former incarceree of Amachi, and I want to honor my parents, uh, Tatsumi and Shizuko Moriguchi, and all my relatives. Um, my grandfather Mitsugoro Morimoto. So the, all the Mori Moro family, the Moriguchi family, and the Matsumura family were all incarcerated at Amachi. Thank you. Other camps, this includes Canada, Hawaii, Department of Justice camps, military bases, and those under house arrest in New York City and other locations. I would like to honor my parents. I think I put it in the chat earlier. Um, Marion Hamoka Igashira and Takashi Igashira, and I've got them in the picture. I don't know if you could see it. As youth, they uh, came to Toronto. They incarcerated in Slocan, British Columbia, and came to Toronto post. They were forcibly moved to Toronto post internment, and we've settled here ever since. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank you. I'd, I'd like to honor uh, Taichiro Maihara, who was my great grandfather, who was uh, interned in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, and also honor his son, uh, who at the same time was was fighting in in World War II for the 442nd, who uh, fought and died for his country. Uh, Saburu Maihara, thank you. Detention centers, we want to acknowledge the detention centers currently holding people, many in solitary confinement without due process. I want to honor the um, hunger strikers in Northwest Detention Center. who have been on a hunger strike to um, improve conditions and faced a very violent crackdown in the last few weeks.
so we always pay special honor and tribute to people, non Jays, who stood with our community in dark times and celebrated with us in joyful times. People who stood up for the right thing when it wasn't easy to do so. So we invite you to name allies to our community. This is Corky Lee in this photo, uh, who was a friend to, I think, all the Asian American communities as a photographer of, uh, of, many, of many activities uh, who, who died two years ago of COVID. I'd like to honor Bob, Bob Emmett Fletcher. Uh, in California, who managed farms for JAs who were incarcerated. I'd like to honor two people. Our neighbor, Mr. Skelcher, who paid the property taxes on our house while we were imprisoned and away from Los Angeles and Grant Stinchfield, who drove our family to Santa Anita Racetrack and also allowed my mother to visit her father who died in the LA County Hospital while we were at Santa Anita. So now we'd like to take a moment of silence for the names called out, the ones in our mind and hearts, for all those who didn't make it and those we don't hear or know about lost to state violence. Thank you all for holding space for our loved ones, our communities, and those we're thinking about. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So we've reached the end of our program, and we wanted to thank you again for joining us. We want to give a special thanks to Suki Tarada Ports for our contributions to community. Suki, we love you. Um, we also want to thank Jeronimo Saldana from On Point Studios for helping to make this today's program possible. The committee also wants to thank our families and friends for their love and support. If you want to support and learn more about the New York Day of Remem Remembrance Committee, visit our website at dayofremembrancenyc.org, make a donation, and join our mailing list. We don't send that many emails. <laughs> Um, we are an ad hoc committee of volunteers, um, and our work depends on donations, so please consider making a small donation to us if, if you're able to. And you can also email us at dayofremembrancenyc at gmail.com. Oh, actually, I have all of this on a slide. One second. I'm going to go back to sharing. <laughs> Here we go. Ah. Um, so if you want to learn more about the New York Japanese American Oral History Project, which um, contributed 
to a lot of uh, Lauren's presentation on resettlement in New York City, um, of which she's a part. Um, the, J the Oral History Project is a collaborative project with several New York-based Japanese American organizations, including ours, NYDOR, JCL New York, Zaja, and JAA Japanese American Association. Um, and we also that we also partner with Densho on that project. You can find out more at the website, which is too long to read, or email Stan H, uh, our very own Stan H dot J A O H P at gmail.com. And you can also support and learn more about Sudo for Solidarity by visiting their website um, or by emailing them. A reminder about the mutual aid groups that Lucas mentioned, um, Team TLC NYC, Artists, Athletes, and Activists, and South Bronx Mutual Aid. All organizations doing critical on the ground work to support people, um, direct aid. So there are a few events coming up um, with the caveat that both are all may maybe already sold out, but we still want to tell you about them because it's great to have so much DOR activity and focus in New York City. Um, tomorrow, the Noguchi Museum in Long Island City will have a Day of Remembrance program starting at 3 p.m. And our committee members will be participating in this special program uh, created by artist and educator Maya Jeffries, who I think is here today. So welcome, Maya. Thank you. And you can visit uh, the Noguchi uh, Museum website for more information. You can register for a time ticket. You can also um, email them at education at noguchi.org to request a ticket, or you can walk in um, to the museum. If they have space, they'll let you in. Um, and then very, very special, uh, LA-based artist and activist Nobuko Miyamoto is doing two in-person book readings next week, uh, both at 6 p.m., one on Wednesday, February 22nd at the Buddhist church, uh, which I believe is sold out. And then one on Friday at Think Chinatown on February 24th at 6 p.m. Um, these are gonna be wonderful uh, in-person book readings and signings of her memoir, um, Not Yo Butterfly. And uh, these programs I believe will be filmed. You can reach out to us for more info if you want to um, find out more. And you can also purchase her book at UC Press. Edu. Can I make an announcement? Uh, sure. Teddy, Teddy, is that Teddy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is for uh, Not Your Butterfly, but uh, at the one on the 22nd, it will be live streamed also. So if anybody wants to join that, I have the uh, the links for that if you need it. They can, you can email me at tiyoshikami at verizon.net. Okay. Can someone put Teddy's email in the chat? That would be helpful. Thanks. Thank you, Teddy. Okay, I can um, put it in. Thanks. So we also have here on this slide that you can go to jcl.org slash day hyphen of hyphen remembrance because there are day of remembrance um, programs happening all over the country this weekend and through next week. Many of them are live streamed or virtual just like ours. Um, and so you can participate if, if, you're, if you have time and if you're interested. Um, and lastly, as Becca mentioned, we are planning an in-person gathering in the spring with food. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, and that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a great rest of your weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>